Good morning, First Baptist Church. Welcome to online worship. As we continue through this time of pandemic, we are unable to gather on our campus and worship together. And that's tough. I miss seeing everyone very, very much. And I know you miss seeing everyone too. Uh, but we are grateful for the technology that allows us to gather and hear and sing the same songs and study the same passage of scripture together and pray together. So I'm so glad you are tuned in and worshiping uh, through this online uh, medium. Uh, we hope you're doing well. I know that uh, you are probably weary and maybe a little bit discouraged as we continue to walk through this time of social distancing and all that that entails. But I want you to know that God is in control and we're going to continue to keep our eyes upon Jesus and take it a day at a time. And I, I want you to know as your pastor that I love you and, and I'm so glad that we are able again to come together and worship the Lord Jesus Christ to fix our eyes upon Him. So I want to pray for us and pray that God would, would move uh, this morning. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We are so grateful for your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love. We are so grateful, Lord, for your presence. Lord, even as we worship in an online format, Lord, we know you are with us. You draw near to us. You inhabit the praises of your people. So, Lord, as we, as we worship you, I pray that you would move with power in our lives, that you would inspire us, encourage us, challenge us, transform us by your grace and for your glory. We love you. We praise you. We are grateful today for the hope of the gospel. And we lift this prayer up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you please join me in singing, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows for the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or will walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, 
Where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Do you want to be closer to Jesus. Folks that know the Lord personally, people that are saved and people that desire to walk with Jesus would answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, I want to be closer to Jesus. Well, in our text this morning, we're going to learn how you and I can draw closer to Him and know Him in a more intimate way. And our passage of Scripture is found in Mark chapter 3. So turn with me. Mark chapter 3. We are continuing our study through the gospel according to Mark. I love preaching through the gospels because when we are uh, looking at the gospels, we are walking around with Jesus. And we've made it in our study to Mark chapter 3, verse 31. The last passage in this chapter. There in Mark 3, verse 31, the Bible says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him. They said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let me read that last verse again. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray together this morning. Father in heaven, it is such a privilege to to study your word. And we come to this time of Bible study with a sense of expectancy. Lord, we expect you to work in our lives through your word, applied to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. So Father, would you, would you move with power in this moment? Lord, touch our lives for your glory. And we'll thank you and praise you for that grace. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. As Jesus is performing uh, ministry in the region of Galilee, we see that He is gathering crowds of people. And as He does some ministry, does some teaching perhaps in a house, His mother and his brothers come looking for him. Now it's interesting to note that uh, Mary's husband Joseph is not mentioned. Most scholars believe that Joseph was probably uh, deceased by this time because he's, he's not mentioned at this point in the life of Jesus. And so uh, probably sometime between the, the birth of Jesus um, and uh, this public ministry of Jesus, Joseph passed away. He's not mentioned. Just the, the brothers and sisters and mother of Jesus are mentioned. And they come to this house. It seems they're not able to get to him because there's a crowd around the house. And so they send word and, and someone comes into the house and says to Jesus, your mother, your brothers, uh, your sisters, uh, they are seeking you. Now, Jesus loved teachable Moments, And he's going to use this as a teachable moment. He's always looking for an opportunity to make a point. And as his family tries to find him, as his family is seeking him, Jesus makes a point about spiritual family. And, and, and here's his point. Here's the point of this, 
final passage in Mark chapter 3. His point is that the closest of relationships are reserved for those who do His will. Let, Let me say it again. Jesus wants us to understand that the closest of relationships are reserved for those who do His will. So if we want to be closer to Jesus, we need to do His will. That's the point that He is making in this text. He he says there uh, in verse 35, Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. They they are close to me like family, a a family-type relationship when they do my will. And so closeness to Christ is reserved for those who do His will. So what I want to do this morning is I want to make three observations about the will of God. He mentions there the will of God in verse 35 and and help us to understand this passage better and and what it means for us to to do the will of God. So, So here's the first truth about the will of God I want you to see. The will of God is good. The will of God is good. In verse 35, he says, Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Uh, Now, the Bible uses the phrase will of God in different ways. Uh, Theologians really try to differentiate between three different ways that the phrase will of God is used. Sometimes the will of God is used to speak of the sovereign will of God. This is simply what God wants to happen. Because God is sovereign and in control, what He wants to happen is going to happen. And when the dust settles on human history, we will see how God, with His power and wisdom, worked out His sovereign will so that exactly what He wanted to happen, happened. God's in control and He is working out His will in our world. This is the sovereign will of God. Acts 18, 21 and Galatians 1, 4 speak of God's sovereign will in carrying out what He wants to happen. Another way the Bible uses the phrase, the will of God, is to speak of God's particular will for an individual. In Ephesians uh, 1, verse 1, and other letters that Paul wrote, he speaks of being called as an apostle by the will of God. He's speaking there of God's will for his particular life. And that's how you and I often think of the will of God. When we talk about His will, we're talking about uh, His particular will for us. And we ask questions like this. uh, Who should I marry? Uh, Where should I go to college? Should I buy a house? You know, particular questions about our own individual lives. And, And we find ourselves seeking God's will for those areas in our life. This is the particular will of God. But there's a third way that the Bible uses the phrase will of God, and that is to speak of God's moral will. God's moral will. This is simply God's expectations for our lives. What God tells us to do, what God tells us not to do. His his moral will, His commandments. He, He desires that we obey His commandments. So let me give you a couple of examples of God's moral will. Uh, so you can see how this phrase is used. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, listen to what the Lord says about His moral will. Verse 3, the Bible says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. And so when he uses the phrase will of God here in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is not talking about God's sovereign will uh, or his particular will for our lives. He's talking about his moral will, his expectation that that we do the right thing when it comes to sexual immorality, that, that we don't participate in that, that we live holy lives. That's his will. That's his expectation for our uh, lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verses 16 through 18, listen to what the Bible says. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God desires, God expects that you will rejoice, that you will pray, that you will be grateful. That's His expectation for your life. That is the moral will of God. So back in in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus says... 
that this close relationship with him is reserved for those who do his will. He's talking about the moral will of God. Those that do what he's, that he, what he's told us to do. Those that don't do what he's told us not uh, to do. And that's the sense in which he uses this phrase. And here's what we need to understand about God's commandments, about God's expectations for our lives. God's will for us, his commandments for us, they're good. They're good. God's will is good. Over in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, uh, Paul writes, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. He's speaking there of the law of God, which, which certainly includes the sacrificial law for Israel, the civil law for Israel, but also the moral law of God, which we would call the Ten Commandments, which still apply to our lives today. And, and here's what Paul is saying. God's law, His commandments, they are good. They are holy. They are righteous. 1 John 5, 3, the Bible says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments, listen, are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. Now this is important because a lot of people believe that if they try to live a life of obedience, God's going to take all of their fun away. That, that God is this cosmic killjoy that wants to uh, prohibit us from doing anything that looks remotely enjoyable. That is a wrong concept of God. That is a wrong concept of His Word. That is a wrong concept of His commandments or His will for our lives. God made us. God designed us. God knows what's best for us. God knows what will allow us to thrive spiritually and physically and emotionally and socially and relationally. And so God, who made us, gives us His commandments to guide us, His will, His expectations. And He gives them to us as a good God who cares about us. And we need to understand that we should, we should be excited about obeying God. We should be excited about doing the will of God, as Jesus said, because His will is good. It is ultimately what's best for our Lives. But let me give you a second truth about the will of God. The will of God is the pathway to draw near to Christ. The will of God, or doing the will of God, is the pathway to draw near to Christ. Back to Mark chapter 3, that, that's the point of this passage. Verse 31, mothers, uh, his brothers, they come to, uh, to, to seek him and, and he's told... They're outside looking for you. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Who gets to know me uh, in an intimate way? Who gets to draw close to me like a, like, a, like a family unit? And he says, those who do the will of God. That's my brother. That's my sister. That is my mother. Now we need to make a distinction here. Because you might read a passage like this and think, well, we we come into a relationship with Christ by doing something, by doing what He tells us to do. And that is simply not what the Bible teaches. You see, we come to know Christ in a personal way by faith alone. The Bible is very clear. We are justified by faith alone, uh, uh, by God's grace alone, in Christ alone. That's what the Bible teaches. Over in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says that we have been justified by faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. And we have peace with God because of that faith. And so we enter a relationship uh, with Jesus through faith in what Christ has done. Jesus came to this earth. He took on human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was born as the God-man, fully God, fully man. He lived a perfect, matchless life. He went to the cross and died on the cross for your sins and my sins. On the third day after His death on the cross, He rose from the grave. He defeated death itself. In other words, Jesus Christ has done everything necessary to save you. He has finished the work of redemption. And you are saved by trusting in Christ and what He has done for you. So you're saved by faith. You're brought into a relationship with God through faith. But obedience is the way that you draw closer to Christ. By doing His will, that, that's the pathway to grow closer to Jesus. 
So if you're saved, you're saved by faith. But if you are seeking to obey Christ and do what He's told you to do, that's how you get closer and closer to Him and know Him better and better and better. Or, or let me say it like this. Obedience proves your love. Obedience proves your love. Over in John 14, verse 15, here's what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, the way that we express our love to Jesus is by doing what he's told us to do. I mean, it's one thing to, to come together and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. We can all give lip service to loving Jesus. But the true measure of our love for Christ is this. Are we doing what he's told us to do? Are we obeying him? Are we following him? We prove our love through our obedience. And here's a good illustration of that. We go all the way back to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And in, in chapter 2, we see that God gives Adam and Eve this wonderful joy and privilege of living in the Garden of Eden in relationship with the Lord, walking with Him through the beautiful garden, experiencing the, the abundant provision of that garden, uh, exercising dominion and, and tending that garden. It is a wonderful, wonderful experience for Adam and Eve. And in, in the midst of Adam and Eve living in paradise, God gave them a commandment, a, a prohibition. He, he says there's, there's, there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can't eat fruit from that tree. If you want fruit, there are all these other trees that you can eat from. But don't eat fruit from that one tree. Now here's the question. Why did God put a tree in the Garden of Eden and prohibit Adam and Eve from eating its fruit? Why did God do that? I mean, God didn't have to put that tree in the Garden of Eden. Well, here's what I believe is the right answer based upon what Jesus says in John 14, 15. Every time Adam and Eve walked by that tree and they said or thought, God, you told me not to eat from this tree and I trust that what you say is best and I'm going to obey you and not eat the fruit from this tree. Every time they made that decision and obeyed that command to not eat, they were expressing their love for the Lord. I trust you. I love you. I know that you know what's best for me. So I'm going to, pro I'm not going to eat from this tree. Obedience to the command, to the prohibition, was a way for them to express their love to God. And, and, and Jesus says, if you love me, do my will. If you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience proves our love. And, and here's the second thing. Obedience leads to intimacy with Christ. If you keep reading in John 14, verse 25, here's what Jesus says. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him or make myself known in a greater way to him. Jesus is saying, if you do what I tell you to do, you will experience a special depth of, of fellowship with me, of intimacy with me. You will know me in greater ways through your obedience. Obedience leads to greater intimacy with Christ. That's the point Jesus is making in Mark chapter 3. And here's a very important thing to keep in mind. The experience of growing closer to Jesus is available to all of His followers. Now if you go back to Mark chapter 3, look what Jesus says in verse 35. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Notice that word, whoever. Whoever. Whoever does the will of God, he gets to experience this family-like closeness to Jesus, this, this special uh, fellowship with Christ, whoever. And so here's what I want you to understand. 
This level of intimacy with Christ is not reserved for pastors or church staff members or missionaries. This level of closeness with Jesus is available to anyone who will obey Christ. To anyone who will do the will of God. So if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can grow closer to Jesus if you will do what Jesus tells you to do. It's available for anyone. Anyone. And so we've seen that the will of God is good. And we've seen that the will of God is the pathway to draw near to Christ. But third and last, I want you to see that the will of God is impossible. The will of God is impossible. Now you might say, wait a minute, Pastor Wade. You told me that I can grow closer to Jesus by doing the will of God. Now you tell me it's impossible. So is intimacy with Christ, a, a growing fellowship with Christ, is it beyond my reach? Is it impossible to do the will of God? And I would say, yes, it's impossible in your own strength. You see, if we're going to live in passionate, joyful obedience, we will need God's help. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus talks about abiding in Him. And as we abide in Christ, He bears fruit through our lives. And then at the end of the fifth verse, Jesus says, For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from God's help, you cannot live an obedient life. It's impossible in your own strength. It's impossible in your own wisdom. I've heard it said that if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you know it had some help getting there. And, and if you ever find yourself walking in obedience to Christ, living an obedient life, joyfully serving Him you know you had some help because you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own wisdom. So what is the help that God has provided? Well, back in John 14, we learned the indwelling Spirit of God is our helper. When we are saved at the moment of conversion, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, comes to take up residence in our lives. He comes to live on the inside of us. He comes to help us. And listen to what Jesus says back in John 14, 15, and then the next verse. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You, you prove your love through obedience. But then he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. The helper there, the paraclete, is the Holy Spirit of God. And so the Lord knows that left to ourselves, obedience is not attainable. A life of consistent, joyful, passionate obedience is beyond our reach because we are weak, but He is strong. And He's given us the Holy Spirit of God to empower us and to guide us and to instruct us so that we can begin to live out a life of obedience to Christ. And as we live out that life of obedience, we are drawing closer and closer and closer to Jesus. And so every day, you and I need to make a decision. I want to be closer to Jesus today. I want to draw closer to Him by doing His will, by, by living in obedience. And, and I know I need some help. And so, Holy Spirit of God, you live on the inside of me. Would you fill my life? Would you empower me? Would you strengthen me? Would you guide me? Would you take control? That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Would you take control of my life so I can live a life of joyful obedience today and experience that family-like fellowship with my Savior, Jesus. See, the danger is that we study a passage like this about doing the will of God, or you hear a sermon like this about obedience and doing the will of God. The, the danger is that you think, okay, I'm going to do better. I'm going to pick myself up by my bootstraps, 
and, and just do better tomorrow than I did yesterday. That, that's not the way it works. A sermon like this should not increase your determination. It should increase your dependence. If you walk away from the sermon thinking, I'm determined to do better, you've missed the point and you're going to fall flat on your face. But if you walk away from the sermons thinking, oh, I want to know Jesus in a deeper, more intimate way, that family-like relationship, I want to do His will and be like His brother or His sister or His mother. I want to know Him at that level. And so, Holy Spirit of God, would you help me? Would you empower me to live this kind of obedience out on a daily basis? basis. This sermon should not increase your determination. This sermon should increase your dependence upon the Lord who enables you to live for Him. But isn't it exciting that we have the the capacity to draw closer to Jesus? We don't have to stay distant from Him. We can know Him in a deeper way every day as we do the will of God. The closest of relationship to Jesus, the closest of fellowship with Jesus is reserved for those who obey Him. And and that's the point of this passage. Now, if you're listening... And you're thinking in your heart, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know Him personally. I'm far from Him and I know it. I've never been saved. I've never been born again. If that's the case, today can be your day of salvation. Know that He died on the cross for your sins. He took the punishment from God the Father that your sin deserves and that my sin deserves. He died in our place. He died as our substitute on the cross. And after He paid the penalty for our sin, after He became the substitutionary atonement for our sins, after He breathed His last and died, He rose from the grave. He defeated death itself. And He has the power to give you eternal life beyond the grave. And if you will trust Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you will place your faith in Christ alone, He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll transform your life. He'll reconcile you to a holy God. And He'll give you the hope and promise of heaven. And He'll grant you the indwelling Spirit of God to help you to live for Him from this day forward. And if you're listening and say, saying, Pastor Wade, I've never made a decision like that. You can make a decision like that right now. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. You can just confess with your mouth. You can call on His name. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, as the Bible says in Romans 10, 13. So if you need to be saved, if you need to be born again, would you call on His name right now? Just Just take my words and and just make them your own. Just say them to the Lord. Just say, dear God, I'm a sinner and I'm far from you. And and Lord, I want forgiveness of my sins. And I believe my only hope is Jesus. I believe He died on the cross for me. I believe He rose from the grave. And I believe that He is the one who saves And so right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Transform me. Help me to live for you. Help me to to surrender my life daily to your Lordship. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I love you and I praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you trusted Christ's finished work. If you trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and, and nailed that down by calling on His name today, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ
forgave you and came into your life to lead and guide you by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you made a decision like that, we want to hear about it. You'll see on the screen a number that you can text. Just text through that number and let us know. I called on the name of Jesus today. I I prayed that prayer with Pastor Wade. I, I asked Jesus to be my personal Lord and Savior. We want to rejoice with the decision that you've made. And, and we want to help you to, to take your next steps on your journey of faith. We want to encourage you in that and, and provide some resources and some help. And so if you made a decision like that, would you just let us know today the decision that you've made? And we will rejoice with you. If you're listening and you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are saved. I want you to think about this sermon. I want you to think about your capacity to to draw closer to Christ through obedience. Right now, would you just ask Jesus to help you to live an obedient life, to do His will, to know Him in a deeper way? Would you ask the Holy Spirit of God to fill you, to empower you? Do you have that desire to, to draw closer to Jesus? In just a moment, our student pastor... Jared Green is going to sing a song that I hope you can take and and make it the cry of your heart today. The song is titled, I Will Follow You. You've heard our minister of music, Jeff Keeman, sing about trusting and obeying. Now you're going to hear this call to, to follow Jesus everywhere that he goes. If we will take those words and make them our own and live according to those, we will experience a growing closeness, a growing intimacy with Jesus Christ. And how exciting is that? Before Jared sings and closes with singing, I will follow. So I want you to know, church family, that we are here for you. Let us know if there's any needs that you have and know that we love you and we miss you. And I want to say, may the Lord richly bless you.